God incarnate, Jesus Christ. You brought color into the world, turned darkness into light. Prince of Peace, Emmanuel. You brought color into the world.
Welcome to Charles River Church Online. My name is Pastor Kevin. I'm so glad that you guys have chosen to jump on here with us. Listen, it's been a weird year. It's been a difficult year for a lot of people, but we have a really encouraging, uh, about an hour ahead of us. And so think about who you know who could use some encouragement right now and make sure there's gonna be a link right in the chat. So invite them to join us right now at charlesriver.online.church. Um, we are so glad that you're here. Will you take a minute and, and, and fill out a connection card? There'll be a link there in the chat to do that as well. Let us know that you're here. Let us know how we can pray for you. We would love to do those things. And we want to be making the most out of this Advent season. This is going to be one that you remember. This is not one of those ones that just kind of turns into a blur like the rest of them. Like I remember that time I got my Tonka truck, maybe. I can't remember if it was 97 or 93, whatever. But no, this is one that you're going to remember. So we want to make the most out of it. So we've created uh, a, a, a list of resources for you. It's called a link tree and there'll be a link for that in the chat as well. I've been reading through a devotional that's linked right on there and you can do the same. We have a bunch of great resources there. One of those resources is a Spotify playlist that I curate, curated myself and I'm very, very proud of it. So please um, jump on there, uh, fill your home with songs that'll point you to Jesus this season. We're gonna take about 30 seconds uh, to say hi, utilize that chat, fill out a connection card. But while you're in the chat, let us know, what's your favorite Christmas song? What song makes you feel like, okay, finally, now it's Christmas? Do that now and we'll be back here in 30 seconds. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Those words written down nearly 3,000 years ago are still as true today and even more so on the other side of Christ's first advent. See, the second week of Advent, we focus on the word joy. That joy that's found in being invited into God's very presence through Jesus Christ. See, at the very beginning, God created man and woman and he lived with them in the garden and they were in his very presence. And Psalm 16 says, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, what is joy though? It's, it's not happiness. Joy is deep and enduring. Unlike happiness, joy is independent of circumstances. It's not bound by what's going on around you because it's flowing up from the inside, from what God is doing inside of you, from his very presence with you. And it's often found in relationship to other people. For the Christian, joy is derived. We get our joy from an unshakable satisfaction in Jesus Christ. No matter what circumstance, no matter what happens, we know that Jesus is with us. And through his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we can receive his joy. See, God has invited you, no matter who you are, God has invited you into his very presence. Take a second and think about that. God invited you into his presence. The God who has no need for anything. The God who is eternal. And he was at the beginning. He is and he always will be. No need for anything. He desires for you to be with him. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father in heaven, with all the distractions gone, we sincerely believe that in your presence is fullness of joy and that you are deep down the deepest, strongest desire of our hearts. Father, we are so grateful to you for sending your Son, that the God of the universe, that the God who needs nothing would look down upon us and that you would send your Son into the world to save us, to rescue us, to ransom us, to redeem us. Father, help us to be full of your joy this season. Help us to be those strange people who are full of joy despite strange circumstances. God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Why don't you join us as we sing Joy to the World this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. That familiar song was written by Isaac Watts in 1719, and for 300 years it's been helping us to celebrate Christmas. Today is the second Sunday in the Advent season. Advent means coming. We are celebrating the coming of Christ at Christmas. And our Advent theme for today is joy, that the coming of Jesus leads to joy. As the angel said to the shepherds in the field that very first Christmas, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. God wants you to have 
the joy that comes with Jesus. There is joy at the coming of the Lord. Maybe on the contrary, though, you've experienced when someone has shown up to your place and it didn't lead to joy. Maybe you've had that family member who comes into town and they're going to stay at your home and they are just so draining and they're so ungrateful or they're hard to host. Maybe they're a little bit needy. And maybe you've had the, the door-to-door salesman show up to your place. I have the solar panel guy who will show up to my house every so often and say something along the lines of, hey, I'm just in the neighborhood and notice that your house is perfectly positioned for solar panels. Uh, if you don't hate the earth, you should give me three payments of $4,000 and I'll put some solar panels in. Or maybe you've had someone show up and your dates were just completely mixed and they were totally unexpected and you were surprised at their arrival. You weren't expecting them at all. Maybe your place is a mess, you're half-dressed, you have nothing in the oven. I'd be curious what you do when that happens actually. Do you fake it? Hey, come on in. Or are you just straight with them and just say, hey, listen, I was not expecting you. I apologize. But when Jesus comes, it means joy. He's not the needy family member. He came to serve. He's not the door-to-door salesman. He came to freely give. He doesn't need to be unexpected company because he tells us that we can expect his coming, that we are to anticipate his coming. And so joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart, I love this, prepare him room. And for the next three weeks together, we're going to be in a series of messages that we're calling Prepare Him Room. That is that we are seeking to be a people who are expecting Jesus. We're seeking to be a people that have made room for Jesus in our hearts. We're seeking to be a people that have prepared room for Him to reside with us. And so this Christmas, we are preparing Him room. We're going to begin by looking at a few people in the the Christmas story that I think often get overlooked, actually. It's Elizabeth. Zechariah and John. And their story is found in Luke chapter 1. Elizabeth and Zechariah are relatives of the, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary, and they are a ministry couple. Zechariah is a, a priest. And on top of that, in their personal lives, they're, they're going through some real difficulty. They're going through a, a challenge of infertility. They so wanted a child, but Elizabeth, at this point, after years and years of trying, is now too old. And now here in, in Luke chapter 1, we come to a really big day in the ministry of Zechariah. Uh, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, we see that there are 24 divisions of priests. And in each division, uh, when they're on duty, they, they go to the temple on duty twice a year under a 48-week uh, lunar calendar. Now, there are so many priests that when it's your division's time to, to, to be up uh, and you're about to start, they would actually have to cast lots or do a bit of a lottery to see which priest would be able to go into the temple and to perform duties. It was a random selection, and the opportunity of all people falls to Zechariah, a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because of the large number of priests, this this would be for a priest maybe just a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get to go deep into the temple in Jerusalem. So this was a huge day for Zechariah. It would have been a great honor for him. Uh, He would get to go deep into the temple in Jerusalem. And so I'm sure his wife and maybe some other friends or family members would travel with them from the rural village they lived in uh, to the big city of Jerusalem to support them. And they're all together there. And it's just a big day in the life of Zechariah. Now, Let's read here his story, uh, Elizabeth's story, in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. I would love to have that said of me, right? Righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. That's the politically correct way to say it. Both were advanced in their life. Verse 8, Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and, he, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. 
and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient, the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. A people prepared. So Elizabeth and Zechariah, they loved, they honored, they feared the Lord. They were faithful in their ministry, but they still had some personal suffering and fertility. But this big day, it's just a bright spot in their life in the midst of their suffering comes. And they they get to go into Jerusalem and his big ministry moment comes. He's in Jerusalem. I'm sure he's dressed in his priestly garments. He goes into the temple. Elizabeth, I'm sure, is outside waiting, supporting him, maybe with some family or friends. And while he's inside, what he would do is he would have placed incense on a heated altar representing the prayers of the people and then he would have taken some time right there to pray on behalf of the Jewish people and in this moment of a lifetime deep inside the temple he's praying on behalf of the people something even more extraordinary happens in this moment an angel appears to him we're later told that the angel is none other than the angel Gabriel himself now what does he tell Zechariah he says Zechariah your prayers have been answered Elizabeth will have a child in his name, John. We know of him today as John the Baptizer. Now, this is obviously a very significant moment for Elizabeth and Zechariah personally. However, even more, this is a significant moment for the rest of the world because this boy is a child of prophecy. This boy has been foretold about long ago. Back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, we're told that, that one will come who will cry prepare the way for the Lord. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, we're told by God that he will prepare the way before me, me being Jesus, that God will become a man and and one will prepare the way before me. And then here, Gabriel tells Zechariah in verse 17, he is the one prophesied about. He is the one who will make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That is, John will be born just months before Jesus. So he's a cousin of Jesus with the God-given role of preparing a way of the Lord to get people ready for Jesus, making a people prepared. The story goes on. Several months later, over in Galilee, Mary is also visited by the angel Gabriel, and she's told that she too will have a miracle baby, that her baby will be God himself taking on human flesh. The miracle is that she's a virgin, and this will be the Lord Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah. Now, shortly after this news, Mary then takes off and goes to be with her her relative, Elizabeth. Uh, Mary is a young pregnant girl. Elizabeth is now an older pregnant woman, and they are close friends. And she gets there after a long journey from Nazareth over to the hill country of Judea. And after that long journey, what we read is, is when Uh, Mary comes to to the house. She approaches the house, and as as she starts to come close to Elizabeth and Zechariah's home, John leaps within the womb of Elizabeth at the arrival of Jesus inside of Mary's womb because there's this powerful prophetic connection between these two unborn children. Mary stays with her relatives for three months until John is born, and then she's going to head back to Nazareth. And there we pick up the, the familiar Christmas story with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the, the animals and the stable and the wise men and the, the angels and, of course, uh, the Christ child. Fast forward, when these men are both grown up, John's ministry begins shortly before Jesus' ministry begins. And John goes out into the wilderness and large crowds start coming to John and he is preparing the people for the Lord. Now, at the beginning of the Christmas season together, as we think on preparing him room, the question is, how? How do we do this? How do we prepare for the Lord? Well, the question also then is, Well, how did John, who's the one to prepare people for the Lord, how did he prepare people for the Lord? There's one word that captures, encapsulates the the message that John repeatedly shared. Repentance. Repentance. I don't know if that just sucked the joy out of the room for you in this moment. Did this guy really insert repentance into the Christmas story? That, that word repentance, I think, gets a bad rap. It's, it's not a killjoy word at all. Repentance simply means a change of direction, a change of plans, a change of the way you, you think, the way you approach things. 
It's not a condemnation from God. It's actually an invitation from God. An invitation to something new. Invitation to something better. Uh, A change from the status quo to trade in all of our ways which aren't working. To change in all of our ways of thinking, all of our usual plans, all of our tactics in terms of how we typically as humans approach life. To trade our ways that don't work for God's ways that do work. Listen to Acts chapter 3, verse 19, as it describes repentance. Peter says, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So repentance is not a kill joy. Repentance is a a thing that leads to joy, right? It, It leads to refreshing because it's a laying down of my plans and my ways and my tactics and my thinking, which can be hard, but to do that for something so much better, something that leads to that good news of great joy. Now here's the picture that I've had in my mind as I've been kind of thinking through and preparing for this Advent season and this Prepare Him Room series of messages. I've been thinking about my wife as she's preparing room, getting ready for a family member or in the past a close friend who's come to stay at our home. And I've always just found her hospitality just so, so beautiful. There's this joy that she has when when she receives someone into our home. I I, I noticed, I've never told her this, but I noticed she she gets a little pep in her step and she kind of floats around around the house as she's, she's getting things prepared. Maybe she'll, I've seen her, you know, prepare the bed for the company and she'll put uh, fresh sheets on there and our, our softest ones. And then on the corner of the bed, she'll put a stack of uh, a towel, hand towel, a face cloth, and, and just prepare the, the linen. Uh, she'll then go get some fresh flowers, pull out a vase and put the fresh flowers uh, in our kitchen there. She'll stock the fridge. I love it when company comes over. She'll stock the fridge with all kinds of good treats for them. And then when they're about to arrive, she'll, you know, typically light a candle to to create a nice smell. She'll start boiling some water so she can offer them tea, and then she'll make sure that the porch light is on so that they can see as they're coming in. And so for me, that's just been the the picture I've had in my head as I'm thinking about preparing and, and preparing for the coming of the Lord this Christmas season. Just the joy of receiving Jesus the, the joy that is captured when we get the chance to receive the Lord, the very presence of God in our lives. But I want to be clear with something. We're not talking about preparing him a room. We're talking about preparing him room, preparing room for the Lord. So another illustration I think I need to add to the illustration of my wife is the Olympics. I love the Olympics. I was super bummed when I found out the Olympics were going to be postponed, but I'm excited now again for uh, Olympics 2021 in Tokyo. Really excited about that. Uh, you may remember a few years back when uh, Boston was going to put a bid in for the Olympics for 2024. We we're going to try to have the Olympics here in Boston, and it didn't go very far uh, because when it comes to having the Olympics in a city, it completely overtakes and overhauls the city. I remember uh, as a kid who grew up in Atlanta when the the Olympics came to Atlanta in 1996, and for years they were, they were working on the highways, widening, adding extra lanes to the highways in preparation for all the, the traffic. There was construction of new rest areas and hotels and, and stadiums and the Olympic Village and arenas and just, can you imagine that though in Boston? No, you can't imagine that in Boston. We're such an established city. Every square inch has been utilized. We have no land. There's no way we could possibly widen our highways, add new highways. That's not going to happen. To prepare Jesus' room, you need to understand that he doesn't fit into our current constructs. That's not how it works. Jesus just kind of fits into our normal system. It's not, hey, Jesus, I have a room for you. Come on in. It's not, Jesus, I have a little compartment in my heart that you can slide into. Jesus, I like you. You know what? I think I can make some space for you. I think maybe I have a a little room in my end. It's not that at all. That's not true biblical repentance. Repentance is I am laying, completely laying down my own way entirely. And Lord, I am coming to you and I want your ways. I want a complete 
change of direction. I want a complete change in my thinking. I want a complete change in how I approach life. I want gospel change. That's the good news of Jesus. I want that, which is an entirely different way of looking at the world that is so foreign to everybody else. That's repentance. I want to be eagerly anticipating and longing for God to come and to completely clear house. That's preparing room, is readying yourself for massive change that comes with Jesus. Now here's the deal. Because of COVID, our calendars have already been cleared, haven't they? Because of COVID, we don't have a ton going on this Christmas season like we normally do. And so you have some space. You have some extra room in your life. I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us to take advantage of this moment that may be just the divine providence of the Lord, that he's working things to good and saying, you know what? This is some space that you now have in your life that you can say, you know what, Jesus? I, right now, I'm going to just fully receive you in. Jesus, I want to welcome you in and just let you clear house, let you do whatever you want to do. Now's the time. Now's the time. So here's what I want to do. I want to give us a chance to respond. I would encourage us to respond maybe in a couple ways. Some of us here, we're, we're, we're followers of Jesus. We, we've been walking with Jesus for some time, but maybe if we were to be really honest as we're doing some, some self-evaluation, as we're thinking about the, the message of the one who prepared the way, which was repentance, that is, complete change of plans. Maybe, maybe what you've begun to do, Christian, is you've been, begun to kind of allow your plans and your desires and your wants to start to kind of overtake what Jesus has called for your life. And maybe you've started to kind of push him aside and push him to the corner of the house, put him in a room. Maybe you've shut the door. I want to encourage you in this time, if you're a follower of Jesus, to say, you know what, Jesus, I need to repent of that. I need to turn. I want to go back to, the Bible says, go back and do the things you did at first. Do you remember when you first gave your life to Christ and you were all in and you said, Jesus, I'm so excited about you. I'll just do whatever you want to do in my life. Maybe you need to take advantage of this season and say, Jesus, just search me, know me, look around my house. And he knows you already. But just say, Jesus, do what you want to do. Rearrange the furniture, rearrange my life. I mean, everybody's lives have been rearranged. Let's, 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 let's have our lives rearranged in the way that Jesus wants it to go. If that's you, I'd encourage you, Christian, that, that you invite Jesus in. Not that he's ever left you, but, but he, doesn't, he doesn't force himself on you, right? The Bible says that he has a still, small voice. The Lord just whispers, I'm here, I'm here. We have space to just be quiet and just to listen in to the Lord and say, God, overtake in a good way. Others of us, we're watching right now, and maybe we've never invited Jesus in. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You call upon the name of Jesus. Say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I, I guarantee you right now, he is at the door of your heart. He's knocking, saying, I'm ready to come in. You open that door and say, Jesus, I receive you. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And that is saved from that separation from God that you have because of your sin and my sin. We're separated from God. But Jesus has made a way for us to be brought back into relationship with God. He wants to come back in your life. Would you invite him in? I pray that this season will be a season for us where we are just marked, marked as a people who are just taking advantage of this moment, a challenging moment for sure. But we can look back with joy at this moment because this could be for us a moment, a Christmas season that changed everything as we just gave it all to Jesus. We turned from our way, our plans, and we turned and said, I want your way, I want your plan, I want to follow you. You have full reign over my heart, Jesus. You have full reign over my life, Jesus. Give it to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Christmas story and all that it means. And thank you for the chance to, to, to see Zechariah and Elizabeth and then John and his message in the Christmas story. And God, we pray that we would take fully the message of John as he's preparing a people for Jesus, and that is to repent. God, I pray that right now we would just say, you know what? Always not working. Help us to see the failures of our way and look to you and trust your way for our lives. And so God, if there's anyone who's, who's watching right now who's not given their life to Jesus, not received him into their lives, God, I pray right now they would repent. 
it would turn from the way of just being independent from God and turn to live a life trusting fully in you and what you've done for them and receive you into their lives. And then God, I pray that for those who've been walking with you, we still have a struggle, the tendency to go and do the things uh, that we, we did before we knew Jesus and, and, and live our own way. And God, I pray that they would uh, receive your good grace to them and begin to walk again uh, in a way that, that is Jesus has all of me. Jesus has infiltrated every part of my life Scriptures say that you are all and in all. So God, would you be in all of our house, every room, everywhere, invade all of our space. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys again for tuning in with us this morning. 
there is so much freedom in repentance. There is so much joy on the other side of repentance. So if you feel that wall between you and that joy in that repentance, let me encourage you, take the time this week and deal with it. Um, we never want to hear God's word and not respond, so we want to give you guys a, a couple of ways to respond this morning. First, if you didn't take a, a, a chance to fill out your connection card, please do that. If you, if you feel like God is doing something, if you have any questions that, that came up while you were listening to, to the sermon, uh, please, again, if you, if you, even if you filled out a connection card earlier and, and you want to pass along a question, please fill out another one and, and let us know. We would love to hear it. We would love to follow up. If you guys have any questions, we want to resource you. We want to help equip you take next steps with Jesus. And another way that you can respond is through continuing to partner with us in, in financial giving. Uh, we are so grateful for your partnership in that. And because of that, we have been able to meet a lot of, you guys have been able to meet a lot of real tangible needs right here in our community, the kingdom of God coming to Boston. And it's really beautiful. So there'll be a link in the chat for that as well. Before you sign off, make sure you take a moment with the reflection moment. And, uh, and continue interacting there in the chat. We are so grateful for you guys, and we'll see you here next week. God bless you.